So if we understand where it comes from, and where it's going, what we need to get out of it, who's going to get it next. So as long as you have those things, then you're covered. <laughs> Welcome to Process Pioneers, the show that takes a deep dive into the minds of decision makers, key influencers, and process experts who are pioneering the world of everything process. Welcome to the next episode of Process Pioneers. My name is Daniel Rayner. I'm the host of Process Pioneers. And in each of these episodes, I have the absolute privilege of sitting down with BPM practitioners, those that are putting uh, process management practices uh, uh, into their organizations day in and day out. We've talked with people from the academic realm, uh, from the consulting world, uh, people that are working internally at organizations. But um, if, if it's your first time uh, watching the series, we do have um, 150 or so, maybe not quite that much, uh, episodes for you to go back and uh, listen to. Um, you know, we, we cover a broad range of topics, as is uh, business process management. Um, but I'm, I'm very excited for today's conversation with Camilla Ellis. Uh, now, Camilla is a senior business process analyst at 3 Plus Consulting, uh, works across a wide range of organizations uh, as a consultant. Um, in large scale transformation. So I'm sure we're all going to learn a lot from Camilla today. Camilla, thanks for joining me. Thank you. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm very excited for this conversation. I know that, um, you know, it, it's it's fascinating to get the experience and the perspective from someone that does work with a lot of, with a range of organizations and you can see what's working across the board, what's not working. Um, I think we were having a brief conversation before we got started and you were saying that there are uh, oftentimes very similar challenges faced when it comes to business process management. Um, so let, maybe let's start off there is, what are these common challenges that you're, you're seeing organizations face when they embark on this BPM journey? Yeah, I think um, the, the common denominator, I would say, that I found in probably the last five years, let's say, that I've been involved in business process management and such, and anything that goes around ages and, and that front, is the lack of understanding of what a business process is. And when you work in, in a part of a, a big project and program of work, when you have business analysts, testers, developers, people from HR, change managers, um, for them to try and understand what do we mean by process and why do we need a process analyst? We've got a business analyst. I think they are doing the process maps. What are you doing? So that sort of uh, the gap of understanding what it is that we're talking about is common, like I found it in every single place where I've been to. As a process analyst, I go, what do you do? <laughs> so and eventually, as we get through the program, uh, they realize that what business process is and how it is core to everything that they're trying to do in terms of implementing either a piece of technology change or a restructure or changing culture or anything that touches the process customer experience, uh, they realize, oh, the process is key. So that process person becomes the main person that really understands how things connect and how it works end to end. Fantastic, fantastic. So for those that are listening that maybe are new to this space, um, maybe they are a business analyst. Can you give us a bit of a breakdown as to the, the two roles, business uh, analysts and process analysts and how they maybe complement or work together? Yeah, definitely. I think it's just uh, in terms of uh, skills and capability, you can just change hats easily. You know, you wear this hat today and the other one tomorrow, you could be a BA today. But normally what I found in this sort of um, large transformation programs is that your business analyst is normally uh, the person who fully understands the process into end so they can see the scope of what is it that they're working with. But they're normally dedicated to a technology team particularly if they're a technology BI, and they would be writing user stories, understanding their acceptance criteria, writing it all perfect so the technology teams can develop or configure whatever it is they're doing, and then the testers test. The process analysts will work with the BI to make sure that the end-to-end -end process is understood in the handoff points at the end of that particular piece of functionality they're building or writing for uh, is understood and easily implemented by the change person when it comes down to handing it over to the business and say, oh, now you operate this new thing. So that's probably the key 
difference and they definitely have to work together depending on methodologies these days they work kind of agile way so your VA would be um, refining user stories and put them all together they definitely need the input from the process analyst to understand who does what <laughs> you know yes. who gets it next you know this piece of thing that you're building for who's going to receive it who puts the inputs into it etc so they definitely work together throughout the, the development and implementation yeah, yeah, great. Uh, there, there are some organisations out there, maybe quite a few of them actually, but um, that maybe they've embarked on a bit of a process um, management journey in the past, but it didn't deliver the results they were expecting. Maybe it was a poor implementation or or whatever it was. Um, can you share maybe some case studies or some wins that you've had or you've experienced personally where um, BPM was very much part of one of these large scale transformations and it, um, and you, you can, I guess, explain to us how it played a significant role in ensuring that the transformation was a success. Uh, obviously, you know, um, I'm sure there's confidential information and, and names and things like that that you can't share, but if you can just give us a bit of an idea of um, what what does a successful BPM implementation look like? I think um, in my, my experience anyway, successful implementation of BPM means or comes together with something else. So if, uh, if, if there is a change, significant change for an, an organization that comes with managing the process, so when you think about the process, the process is the core, and this is what I was saying a little bit earlier, of your operating model. So any business, when they look at a business model, they have, okay, where does my revenue come from? These are my customers. Mm -hmm. These are my suppliers. I, the things that I do, the activities are normally in the middle. So if you refer to like a business model canvas, processes in the middle. So it's the core mm. of your operating model, which means mm. that if you bring change to the organization, you have to understand your processes. You need to design it. You have to understand how you're going to develop those. Then you have to go through how are we going to monitor? So your whole cycle of management of those processes comes with it. So... Mm. If you were to implement it in isolation, just because it's good to have a good practice, then you don't get the benefits of doing so. Mm. So it's successful when, when in, in my experience, your people, um, legislation, I don't know, there are different areas that force certain change. So your leadership team who understand that change at a strategic level would definitely be really keen to understand what it means from a process point mm. of view and what you need to do in order to embed the change going forward in managerial processes. So it's definitely um, something that as professionals, we can also help them understand a little bit better because sometimes people say, oh, business process, business process, process maps, you have to manage them, you have to know this, but without the context of what it means to the rest of the business model or the operating model, which normally executives and, and, and those people who are signing the bills, they, they work at this level. They, they don't, mm -hmm. when you say process map or that this just doesn't even register, they don't see why it is important. It's just a tool. Mm -hmm. uh, it's mm -hmm. just more providing that context of mm -hmm. how, how a process fits within your operating model and what sort of things you need to change about yeah. it sometimes it's mm. just actually you need to start managing the process in order for you to achieve this strategic change that you're trying to achieve and point them yeah. to the areas where you can see clearly you know what areas need some some work in order yes for them to achieve a strategic outcomes yeah okay so so in terms of the language we should be using as process practitioners um, what language should we be using and what language shouldn't we be using when when talking to that the leadership team? Um, I think, you know, if we're talking to um, executives, you know, we probably don't want to take them straight into a process map without definition of what, what is this? You know, what are you trying, what, what does the process achieve? And normally... Uh, naming the processes. Um, Alex Sharp is great, by the way, in terms of helping us uh, with 
the semantics around Correct. using plain language. You yes. know, that, that your process should be able to tell uh, from an executive to an operator mm. what what the process includes. Um, mm. But the things that we don't want to go and talk to them about is um, a throw in a catch or, you know, <laughs> things like, <laughs> and, and even sometimes like a CIPOC model. Well, they don't know what a CIPOC is and they right. probably don't need to know that. But yeah. what they need to know is what are the things that are feeding your core process and what comes out of it? You know, what are the outcomes that you're achieving out of this? And if you change that, what does it mean to your model, to your business model? And, and that is a high level. Obviously, you go through, you know, any sort of program or uh, initi- initiative of big change goes through phases. So, you know, you go at this level, executive level, but then you dig into detail. And the more you get into work, you know, you, the different practitioners, then you change the language. Because if you're talking to a data person about a process, what they care about, they, they need to know a little bit more detail than just yeah. the, the outcome. They actually need to know what comes in. Is it a form? How many attributes does it have? Are you going to give me this? Are you gonna, and then you have to tell them out of this process, I need this, this and that because we need to measure X, Y, Z. So mm. it, you kind of have to change the language um, according to who you are communicating to, mm. but you're using the same let's say, map to understand the whole flow if when it yes. comes down to getting into the detail. Yeah, okay, okay. And um, and what would you say are those main drivers or motivators um, for the executive team? Like you, you, you're, you're speaking their language, you're communicating in the way that makes sense to them. Um, what, what are those more common drivers for them to be like, right, we need to invest into this, we need to do this because of compliance or operational efficiency or st- standardizing and simplifying like what are those main drivers that you you come across i think um the, the combination of what you just said and i would probably add um trying to help their people do their work day to day and achieve the outcome they're looking for because a, a lot of the times we come up with when they design processes and we think they're going to be great but mm-hmm. unless you provide your operators with a cl- with clarity for them as to what the process is and give them the clear instructions to follow that process, chances are they won't follow it. So mm-hmm. if they don't follow the process and you cannot even monitor or see what the process is doing, then you're trying to lead an organization going blind because you don't know where mm-hmm. you're going. You, you don't, mm-hmm. you know, you... You've got an idea or a concept of what you, you thought my people were doing. But when it comes down to the numbers, it's like, oh, it is not happening. Either you get into many compliance or either your compliance issues are going off the roof and you don't know why. So mm. it's just um, linking the outcomes they're looking for from a strategic point of view to the operations and what it means at an operational level to be able to perform a process in the way that will help them achieve those outcomes. Yeah, yeah, great, great. And um, so we've touched on, obviously, um, communicating to the leadership team, but as you as you mentioned, processes touch every area of the organisation from the leadership team through, down through to the operator. How do you bring everyone along this journey? Because I'd imagine that um, for each of these different individuals, whether it's oper- uh, in the operator space, middle management, senior leadership, um, you're working with different people with different motivators um, that are after different things um, that maybe have different fears and possibly insecurities. Um, how, how are you working with these different groups to bring them along the journey so that you're limiting, I guess, as much objection and resistance as possible? Normally, I get work really closely with people in change management, first mm-hmm. of all, uh, just to help with the understanding of the new process, what you know, mm-hmm. whatever we're trying to, to change or embed, um, and try and identify certain areas per group, you know, normally per role. So, as you know, you look at the process and you understand who's 
accountable and responsible mm. for what. So work with the uh, change management area to help them say, okay, for this particular group, these are the key areas of accountability. They are responsible for these areas. Key pieces of change are here and help them take care of those things by highlighting the key things that you know are changing as you work mm. through the process design. Um, mm. And you do that, uh, you know, with people that work in HR and things like that. Sometimes some some of these changes have significant impact on on people. So mm. so it's just um, collaborating a lot with people that work in change management, um, having that sort of change management strategy. So, you know, how do you going to get your leaders on board? Because it depends on, you know, where the organization is at in terms of the, the culture and the leadership capability, how much work mm. you need to do with your change management team to work out a strategy to help the different groups come up to um, up to speed with, with the processes. I mean, in, in the delivery area, when I mean process delivery and technology delivery space, um, again, it's a lot of collaboration and, and normally workshops. So you um, design a process collaborating with your BA, with the tech, uh, with someone from the data space. Normally it could be a data migration, data lead, or someone responsible for the data space. Um, mm-hmm. If there is business intelligence or anything like that, people involved, you bring them along to work through the process. So once you have a design, there's a little bit of comms that goes with it or like show and tell, whichever mm. um, way they use Different programs use different mechanisms, but if there's agile and you do showcases, you just stand up in front of a lot of people and you walk through the process and the key things that are going to change or the key messages in regards to that particular process. And normally you sort of follow certain um, criteria, make sure that you cover everything. So you talk about um, what, what is the, the pain points we're trying to solve? What uh, what does the future look like for this process? Uh, what are the key things that we're going to need from the different areas? So you say, oh, mm. wait, from tech, we're going to need X, Y, Z. That mm. is going to have to do X, Y, Z. Um, people changes or impacts will be X, Y, Z. So it's just working it all through in a sort of systematic manner, but communicating it consistently through workshops and show and tell type of thing getting the feedback because you don't always get it right. You know, you're sort mm. of learning as well. So getting the feedback and adjusting your process, I think that's another area as well. You, we tend to think, oh, I've done it. It's done. No, it isn't done. You, you have to be open to always change it because things change um, either in the mm. environment or uh, even new learnings, things that you, oh, I didn't realize that we were also doing this. Yeah, we do. So you just have to be open to change a little bit and and mm. keep those processes open to to change. How do you embed minor changes mm. to it? It's, it's always an ongoing mm. thing. Yeah, yeah. And I guess as more and more of our processes are being digitized and being automated, then there's a whole different sort of um, opportunity there where we've got this workforce that's shifting from um, certain tasks um, that are now being automated. We've got bots coming in, things like that, and we've got to redeploy those resources elsewhere. Um, How how, how do we manage that um, as, I guess, from a process perspective? Yeah, definitely. So we would probably do that through, again, just going through the workshops understanding what are the key things that are changing, working very closely with um, with the leaders, people in, in, in change, in the change space, to understand those impacts um, and then identify opportunities for other areas. So, you know, some, sometimes there's just a strategy in terms of your um, human resource impact mm. and coming up with a strategy as to once you understand the impact what do they need to learn? Because a lot of it as well will be culture and um, learning. So helping people learn the new process and what it means for them to operate in a digital way. And that's only not just internal, but your external users, some of the processes you're bringing in, um, change the way that your customers interact with the organization. 
And that all that is once you understand the level of, and at all the sort of different levels of detail, you know, like when you're talking about the change strategy, your customer strategy, and all these things, the process at a high level, as long as you understand the key components of it, you can come up early on with a strategy in terms of how do we, um, what, what does it mean to our customers? How do we communicate to our customers? When would be the best time to communicate that we are now going to have an app that can do X, Y, Z? So mm. all those things you can work out earlier in the piece as long as you understand your high-level process. In, you know, what, yeah. Because otherwise it, it's really messy. But if through the high-level process and everyone's on the same page, then working with your change people and this sort of change management strategy, you can work out how are we going to deal with all the different areas that are actually going to be impacted. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, um, I, you know, I think it's, um, it is very important to understand the, when we do make change, the potential impact that it does have on other areas of the business, whether that's um, upstream or downstream or um, even on other um, systems or applications or roles or, um, you know, a, a wide range of things. You, you need to be able to see the relationship there um, or the correlation between all of these different pieces that are happening. You, you don't want one area of the business to um, radically transform their process, but it actually causes major bottlenecks downstream and yeah. causes the whole thing to fall over. That's right. That's right. And that's what we we come in with our process hat and we go, what is the process end to end? So if we understand where it comes from and where it's going, what we need to get out of it, who's going to get it next, then you, you're covered. You, then you know how to deal with um, the level of change and therefore be prepared to deal with the subsequent um, impacts to other organizations or your key stakeholders mm, yeah yeah great uh, if you could um if you could get gather all of the uh, process analysts um in new zealand let's say um and uh download plug a usb into their head and download something um, that's going to help them best prepare for the next two three five years what would you what would you be downloading into their heads i think um Oh, that's a pretty hard question. I think it's understanding to me uh, the essence of the process. What is it that we're doing? And mm -hmm. in trying to help with a systematic way or a framework to mm -hmm. help cover all the bases. So, you know, do I understand what's in the process, do I know the inputs, the outputs, what are the key steps, who are the people involved, what triggers this thing, um, and what, what, what comes out of it. Then if you understand that systematically, then you go, okay, once I have that and I understand what areas do I need to consider about this process? Oh, okay. What does it mean to technology? What does it mean to people? What does it mean to legislation? And, you know, if there's any other areas within an operate model, you know, your customer, what's it mean to my customers? Then you go, oh, I've got coverage. I know my data, my customer, my tech, my people, performance metrics. Yeah, I got it. So as long as you have those things, then you're covered. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great. And and I'd imagine you you'd be noticing um, certain trends. I mean, over the past five years, at least, you would have noticed um, the BPM landscape evolve and adapt and, and change and um, go through different ebbs and flows. What what are the trends that you are noticing for the future? Obviously, you know, technology is huge, been huge, and um, there are lots of organisations that are di diving it technologies like RPA and process mining, things like that. But uh, from your perspective, what what, else, what does the next three, five years look like um, for BPM? Where where are we heading? Are we going to see any, any crazy radical sort of innovation in the BPM space or is it getting the fundamentals right? Um, what, what would you say the next five years will look like? I, I 
I think getting the fundamentals right is where we are going to all going to sort of be doing more of. But just because there's a lot of um, change out there regarding, you know, automation and different tools and uh, configuration of tools, right? Uh, we don't do code. We just configure things and trying to reuse a lot of, uh, you know, optimize um, technology resources as much as possible. And often it gets, let's get straight into trying to automate something that is not fully understood and ends up in a lot of rework or not even happening. Like some some projects don't even go ahead because it will end up costing a lot more. So it's probably a lot more. Let's just take it back to basics and being able to uh, quantify the investment at that level before you get Mm. into it. Because, yeah, there will be probably a lot of uh, constraint on funding to embed a lot of change to bring new technologies or replace technologies. So it's got to be um, being able to fully understand what the change is about, how much it's going to cost. And you can only do that unless you you understand the scope of the process that is changing and having alternatives. Mm. Because if you don't do the basics halfway through your program, you may have to compromise and say, okay, mm. I don't want to automate this part. Okay, so what does it mean? Mm. From you know, you can save some money, but what 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 are you going to lose uh, from a yes. customer, people, or um, you know, any other aspect of your organization if you decide not to automate certain things halfway through? Mm. So mm. yeah, I think is having the the tools and the frameworks to take you back to basics in a hurry and being able mm. to uh, pivot if you need to. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. No, that's great. Uh, well, Camilla, I just want to thank you for sitting down with me today. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. I've been taking a bunch of notes and I've been gleaning a lot. And I know that the audience um, will have as well. Uh, for those that are listening, if you have enjoyed this conversation, please leave us a rating or a review. That would mean a lot to us. Um, where, you know, as I mentioned at the start, we're almost at episode 150 and we love seeing the episode get um, listened to and viewed uh, far and wide. Um, so giving us a rating and review would certainly help us do that. Um, but Camilla, I just want to thank you again. Uh, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I love your work. Um, so, yes, keep keep going, bringing all this sort of people together so we can share knowledge and just carry on. I I think it's great that you're doing this.